when I say I interviewed for at least a hundred companies. There's one thing to apply and get rejected. Yeah. It's another thing to apply, get the interview and yeah. then get rejected. Cause After becoming a wife and a mother, the level of drive that I have now mm. with each call, with each opportunity, with each meeting, I'm hungry. I'm like foaming at the mouth, like at the, and then in a cage, like I need to get it no matter what, by wow. any means necessary. It's a blessing to be in a company that goes hard for you just as much as you go hard for them. It does make life different yeah. when you're at companies where they go above and beyond to really do things to show that they care about you and they want you to thrive. Even though you're rejected, do the work. Your resume could be beautiful, perfect, but if the time is not right, this time is not right. Let's be real. The tech industry, and not even just the tech industry, but especially the tech sales industry, is naturally seen as a very like masculine space. And so more often than not, usually, it's the ladies, women, I'm gonna be real with y'all, I've been hearing y'all, many of y'all are like, man, is this space really for us? Is it for women? You know, or women are saying, you know what? I, I feel like I'm very feminine. You know, I feel like I'm very soft. I feel like I'm, I, I feel like, like, I wouldn't be a good fit in that space, especially not the tech sales space. Well, look y'all, I have a guest on that I feel like is the epitome of femininity, the epitome of softness, of sweetness, all that good stuff. Cassandra Jones, thank you for being on Tech is a New Black. Thank you so much for having me. It's yeah. been a minute, this but it's good crazy. to be back. <laughs> this is super crazy. I, mm -hmm. I was gonna say something uh, earlier, but I said, you know, I'm gonna save it for the podcast. Not, now we doing the podcast, so I'm gonna say it now. Okay. I was like, yo, this is what I was gonna say. Last time I saw you, you were single, and you ain't had no kids, you ain't had no children. Nothing. And it feels like I blinked, like it was not that long ago. I blinked. Also, last time I saw you, I wasn't in tech. Uh -huh. A couple years later, you know, now you are a wife. And you have two beautiful children yes. now. Which is fire. It's amazing. That's so fire. Life. And y'all look good, too. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all y'all feeling me looking good. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, life has changed so much. For me, in a short span of time, yeah. I can only give God all the glory for that. But yeah. I did have to do the work to get up to that point. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure today we're going to be diving deep oh, yeah. into that. <laughs> yeah, we got to talk about yeah. that. We especially talk about that work like with that transitions. I think so often people just... It's like within that couple of years, like we mentioned, the last couple of years, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. But many times people want things to happen kind of like at the, the snap of the finger or the flip of a light switch. But right. it's like, there is work that takes place before that and even during that right. for those things to happen. So yeah, I de definitely want to talk about that and unpack that. But, but anyway, let, let's first start off just at the beginning. So, so talk a little about when we met, but how did you like, cause, cause when we met, you were pageant queen, all of those things, creative, mm -hmm. all of those elements, everything about you almost seems completely opposite of the tech industry right of what people would think the tech industry is how did you go from all of that to transitioning to breaking into tech i feel like my life has been like this beautiful quilt or tapestry and every event weaved into the next event right mm -hmm. so the way that i broke into tech is from my experience into sales initially okay. and from that was from modeling let me start. Let me let me let me backtrack. Wait, wait. Modeling and okay, yeah, yeah. you gotta talk about this. So, before I start this story, I just want to tell everyone: if there's an opportunity that comes in front of you, seize the moment. Okay. Because from this moment that I'm about to tell you forward, it just pushed my life into Hold the it atmosphere. The, like the, it's amazing. Yeah. So. It is possibly the year 2018. I am modeling at. It's called Freight Depot. It's like a location in Atlanta. Freight Depot. Freight Depot. Okay. And that's where the fashion show was housed. And it was, I was a model for one of, I think there was an event that was happening and it's for different schools like SCAD or the Art Institute of Atlanta and, and their fashion students, they were graduating and yeah. they wanted to, they each had collections and they wanted to showcase their collections for their so that they, they can earn their degree. So I was one of the models casted for this event. Backstage, I have, um, I'm surrounded by the media, all the cameras are around us, and the host 
disappears. We have no idea where the host of this media um, show goes. That's and, crazy. Right. And, you know, I took it upon myself and I'm saying, hey, I can fill in for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And they're like, sure, go ahead. And I grabbed the mic and I'm like, hey, what's up, guys? This is Cassandra. I'm backstage here at the Freight Depot here in Atlanta. We're so excited. We're pumped. Look at these beautiful models. And as I'm talking, this six foot five man walks up to me in my periphery. Mm-hmm. And I'm panicking inside, but the camera's on, so I have to stay oh, on. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? And that poker face. Poker face. And the man is approaching me, polished to the T. Uh, gr- like the most powerful man I've ever met in yeah. person, like his energy. Mm-hmm. And I'm a little intimidated, but I have to keep going. And as he's approaching me, I say, you know, here we have one of our designers. Tell us a little bit more about your collection. And there was this awkward pause. And I'm like looking at the camera and the camera guys are like motioning to me. No, 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 no. And I'm like, what, what's going on? And I'm like, come on. Here you go, tell us about your collection. And it turns out it was the president of the Art Institute of Atlanta at the time. Oh my gosh. And I was mortified, but um, he, he, he laughed it off, he introduced himself, and I, sp- and I spun the interview, and I'm yeah. like, tell us a little bit more about you know, how you feel about your students, how proud you are, and he just went into his spiel. Yeah. And then after that, the, the interview wrapped, and you know, I I just, I leave, I go backstage, I get my duffel bag, you know, the models were just wrapping up or getting all that stuff. And he actually approaches me and gives me his card and says, you know, I'd love for you to interview for a role at my company. And I'm like, what's the role? So I give him a call the next week um, and I visit the building and it's for an assistant director of admissions role at the Art Institute of Atlanta. (laughs) And that's how I got the role. And I'm like, what is it about what I, what happened, you know, made you interested in hiring me as a salesperson at this institute. And he was like, you know, there are a lot of soft skills in sales yes. that you can't, it has to be intrinsic, you can't, you can't like you teach can't it. teach it. Yeah. And uh, I have confidence, I had the audacity, <laughs> yeah. I was fearless and I was warm, I was inviting and yeah. I wasn't afraid to speak to a complete stranger. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's how I got the role into sales. Yeah, and also, how quickly you were able to think on your toes. Right. You know. And pivot. Yeah. I was humiliated on camera. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm sure you had a poker face. Though. Right. And in sales, you, you get humiliated mm-hmm. in different moments, but to like maintain composure, poker face, all of that, that is, that's a fire story. Yeah. That's <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. But um, when I walked into the building my first day and I would tell my peers how I got the role, they were like, there's no way that that's how it happened. Yeah. From modeling straight into a sales role in mm-hmm. education, it wasn't in it wasn't in tech just yet, yeah, yeah. but that role at the Art Institute, although it doesn't seem like a sales role, it was a sales role, mm-hmm. okay? We had um, quotas, we had KPIs to meet. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my, fr- because when I first broke into sales, my tech sales, my Mm -hmm. role was an SDR. Okay. And at that company, banging out the phone calls. (laughs) That's how I, that's how I sharpened my sword, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, But yeah. So, okay. All right, man, there's so so much to unpack here. All right. Right. So, so you, you were there working admissions Mm -hmm. and you were doing a lot of cold calling, being able to kind of cut your teeth on a entry level sales type of job. Mm -hmm. Was it, was it after that that you ended up going through like a season of unemployment Absolutely. before you actually got in tech? Yes. Okay. So, one, why did you go through a season of unemployment? And two, like, how long was it? And three, like, what was your mental state like during that time? I worked at the Art Institute for that role for mm-hmm. two years. It was an awesome experience. I learned a lot. I met amazing people. And the students that were there at the time when I enrolled them and graduated were still friends to this day. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was an awesome experience. However, I felt as though that there was a ceiling that I was meeting. Yeah. I reached all my goals and I, I, you know, top five or top 10 salesperson in the company at the time. and. I wanted to get to the bag. Let's just keep it a oh, bag. Yeah. Let's just keep it a bag. Like, Try to get to the bag. I had to get to the bag. And in that, it was interesting because as a model, pageant queen, I never really faced rejection. 
mm-hmm. before, to be honest with you. I've never really faced it. So I had this delusional confidence in myself, like, I'm just going to leave this role. I don't know what the climate is like in the corporate world, yeah. interviews. I don't know what it's like. I'm just telling myself, I'm going to make it. So I'm going to put in my two weeks and surely I'm going to get another role. Yeah, it's going to walk into something else. It's just going to fall on my lap, just like <laughs> everything has fallen on my lap, right? Yeah. Delusional. And I felt like that was the season where God met me yeah. and was like, all right, I'm going to sit you down. <laughs> I'm going to sit you down for a very long time, wow. actually. And it was a year and like four months. Ooh. But here, but the beautiful thing in that, oh man, I felt as though I was in a boxing ring with God. Mm-hmm. And God and I were sparring, constantly oh. sparring. <laughs> the sound effect. <laughs> okay, so so what do you mean by that? So y'all are in a boxer ring. I love that he sat you down. Mm-hmm. What did that look like? That season with God. It's it looked like a lot of rejection. When I say I interviewed for at least a hundred companies, there's one thing to apply and get rejected. Yeah. It's another thing to get. Apply, get the interview, and yeah. then get rejected. Cause, oh, all right, you know what? I have my opinions as to why, but I want to ask you why is it is it worse or does it sting different when you actually get rejected it's, after interviewing? It stings different after because I pour everything into myself. Yeah. When I say I'm in the lab, Cyrus, I'm in the lab when I'm interviewing for yeah. these companies. I will, by the time I sit in front of the uh, the recruiter or the um, the hiring manager. It's as if I'm, I'm your coworker. I know almost everything about the company. I know Dang. the stocks. I know the, the leadership board. I know the, the, I know the product. I know who your competitors are. I know where your shortfalls are. I know what happened in the news oh, last you week. Do your, okay? You do your homework. I'm in the lab. Okay, So it's when you devote that much time and energy into each company and then you get, you got to take that L oh my over God. and over and over again. <sighs> But I tell you what, it was a purpose for that. So what my mind thought about when you shared that is, I don't know why my mind goes this direction, but it's it's almost like a person that really wants to be in a relationship and they study and learn everything about the person before the date. Mm hmm. And they're like, OK, I'm going a, I'm to a be like on my P's and Q's. I'm going to really line up with what this person wants. And then after a hundred dates with a hundred different people, all the people turn them down. Anybody in their right mind would be like, what the hell is wrong with me? With like, me. what's going what on? What is wrong with me? What am I man. doing wrong? That's so, so, man. So it's it's so beautiful because it, at the time, I'm sure it wasn't beautiful. Mm-hmm. But it's so beautiful because it's a beautiful thing to be confident. But for God to take you through a season where not only were you not getting a job right away, but also you were getting the interviews and naturally as a pageant queen, as a model, a lot of your confidence is built up in, hey, my personality, my, mm-hmm. be- my, my beauty, my poise, all of those things. Right. And to actually do an interview and to be able to display those things and after roughly 100 different interviews and to be rejected after all of those times, how did that affect like, like, just how did that affect you in general? What are some things you were going through emotionally, mentally? Like, how did that affect you? It affected my confidence. It made me question myself. Uh, it, I think that was the start of my imposter syndrome. Yeah. Because imposter syndrome is not necessarily low competency. You have high competence. It's just mm-hmm. low confidence. And it, That's real. that rejection, it eats at you after time and time again but god is so good because mm-hmm. now hindsight is 2020 because there was so much practice in those interviews and when i finally broke into tech i was in some really good tech companies but it wasn't my dream company yeah right and i networked and i went to another company but it still wasn't my dream company and by then I interviewed a lot by that time. Yeah. So when that time finally came and I got that e- and I got the email from Google and I'm like, nah, this is a this That's is this is wild. This is not real, right? So the recruiter scouted me on LinkedIn, yeah. hit me up via email, and I'm like, this is a spam. It's not real. So I, I dubbed it. Like I completely neglected the oh, email. Because yeah, yeah, I thought it was a spam. Like, I'm like, this is He's like, oh, some scammer trying yeah. to get me. Yeah. And then the they followed up 
And I was like, oh my goodness, this is real. Wow. I followed up with them. I looked them up on LinkedIn. I'm like, this is real, this is real, good Lord. And when I say hindsight is 2020, all that rejection that I faced, yes. practiced, sharpened my sword. Ooh. When I say I knocked that interview, those three interviews out of the park, there were three main interviews at Google, but then you have like the hiring manager interview and then you have the recruiter interview. There's yeah. like a total of five or six in total, mm -hmm. but those three main ones were the ones that I prepared for all the time in, in the in the past, yeah. That is so incredible because first off, had you ended up in one of the other companies, then you, you would have never, at least not in the time that you did, ended up at Google. Right. Google is such, and I'm gonna be real, I usually tell people to not really go after the big companies, especially as like, it's your first time in tech, I don't go after the big companies. Mm -hmm. And for you to receive so much rejection, it's like, and like you mentioned, it's, cause, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm imagining that had you, let's say your 10th interview was with Google, do you think you wouldn't have performed as well? No, I wouldn't have been ready. Man. Because, there's three different interviews, right? There's googliness, there's leader, there's role-related knowledge, and then there's like um, a general cognitive assessment. Okay, yeah, you 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 teaching me something right now. Okay, right. and those three interviews are you have to prepare each by each by themselves, and okay. sometimes uh, they're back to back on the same day, and they won't tell you the order <laughs> in which they give them to you. Uh, so. One of one of the interviews is just about personality. How mm -hmm. are you? Are you a culture fit? You yeah. know, intrinsically, how are you as a person? Are you a good person? Do yeah. you see the silver lining in difficult situations? Mm -hmm. um, the second interview is role related knowledge. How well do you know your particular role as a sales engineer, as a BDR, yeah. as an account manager? Do you know what you're doing? And then the general cognitive assessment is wow that that interview you can't they can teach they can teach you how to answer it in like a formula but that answer is all on you they're trying to see if they if you're able to think six layers deep with this particular mm. question yeah. right um they can ask you a question like hey cyrus you know if you were looking to if you were let's say for example in the interview they're saying cyrus Let's say, for example, how would you run an event? The average person will say, I would run this event in X, Y, and Z, yeah. right? And that's not even, there's no right or wrong answer. Yeah. They're just wanting to see if you can follow up with a clarifying question. Mm. You know, if there is, if, for example, the, the way that I would like teach someone to answer that yeah. would be, how would you run an event? Okay, where is this event located? Oh, so instead of you just answering, you're like, okay, let me follow Clarify. up with me. Oh, that's Clarify. good. Clarify. Is, where is this event located? Yeah. Is it, is it an internal event or an external event? Yeah. What department? What's the head count? Right? So that's you're just going deep. So good. You're, you're, you're getting more, f like a funnel, like you're yeah. getting more specific. You know, like what's the head count? Is there a budget? That's, Do, man, yeah. that's so good. Yeah. That's so good. And I, I think, because I think through like as a sales engineer, it's like the same way a, a prospect want something they want a solution and they're like hey can your company or can your product do x y and z well yeah it can but why do you need that right okay we need it because of this okay if you don't have that if you if you're not able to accomplish that how does it impact your organization mm -hmm. and it's like like so just like you're mentioning it's important to like really dive in and find the pain point exactly. and so it makes sense that that those would be questions they would ask and not even just those would be questions they would ask but those would be the type of ways they would want you to answer they would want you to see okay or they would want to see okay are you going to ask clarifying questions are you going to dig deeper yes. or are you just going to jump in and answer the question Correct. because most companies and, and i want people to understand this most companies, like most companies' competitors, they all generally do the same thing for the most part. But the question is during whether we're talking demos or even just selling a product, it's not even about, okay, can our product solve the issue, but can we touch on the emotional pain points and the why behind someone needs a product? Yes. And 
I'm not even sure if, if I'm explaining this properly, but I'm, I'm just delving into this because I, I love how during the interview process, because most companies don't even do that. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think that's why most other companies would accept someone that's not as qualified as how Google would mm -hmm. want to want someone that they're going to accept. Right. So that's fire that during all of those interviews you went through and you dealing with all of that rejection, how it was truly sharpening you and preparing you exactly. to be super qualified for an opportunity like Google. Yes. Yo, so for everybody that's interested in what this guest is talking about and you will love a similar career, I suggest you check out Course Careers Bootcamp. Course Careers is a bootcamp that I have been partnered with for well over a year now, and they have helped more people break into tech, I'll be honest, than any other bootcamp that I've personally seen. So look, Course Careers is only 500 bucks, that's it. But if you use our discount code, Cyrus50, you'll get an additional $50 off, so that way all you pay is actually $449. That's it, no additional price later, no extra cost, extra fees, that's it with the price for Course Careers. Now, they're a self-paced boot camp that you can take and be able to get a variety of different roles in tech. So make sure you check them out. Use our link below in that discount code if you want an additional $50 off and keep us posted on your journey breaking into tech. So not only did you go through a period of, of unemployment, mm -hmm. but also from when I knew you, you went through a, a period of singleness. Yeah. And the reason why, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, a lot of people are single, but with you, when, when I met you and a lot of people that I know knew you, you were in a long-term relationship. As far as everyone can tell, it was kind of like, people kind of almost kind of saw y'all as if y'all are like, oh yeah, they're going to be together forever. Right. And then it ended and it was like, oh. And it was like a while, at least as far as I could tell, where it's like, okay, man, Cassandra's single. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you definitely on surface level moved like a woman where it's like, man, she doesn't seem like the kind of woman that would be single. Like she seems like the kind of woman that would, you know, have like a, a quality long-term relationship and or even a marriage. Yeah. And so how, so we talked about you going through a period of unemployment. How was that period of singleness for you, specifically a woman like yourself? And where you're, you're very, you're very independent. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're needy, but it's like you just are the kind of woman where it's like, man, like she just seems like the kind of woman that would be a huge asset to a quality man, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. So how did you go through that? And what's something that you could like relate to women that are going through that that also feel like, man, I feel like I'm the kind of woman that would be a huge asset and value to a quality man. Yeah. So. It's interesting that you bring that up because I haven't spoken on this topic mm -hmm. in years. So yeah. it's 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 slightly refreshing that I get the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah. But I was in a nine year relationship. Woo, I didn't my, know it was that long. <laughs> it was nine years with my high school sweetheart. Man. And you couldn't tell it you couldn't tell me that we weren't gonna get married. Oh that yeah. That he wasn't my forever. Yeah. Right. But that one thing that I noticed in that relationship, although we we grew we literally grew up together. Yeah. Um, but anyone can relate to this. When you're in a relationship, it's almost as if like you're in a race. Mm -hmm. Your partner's right next to you, on your mark, get set, go, and you guys are going, right? Yeah. At some point, depending on your the, the journey that you're on, you're going to do things that's gonna elevate you. You're going to invest in yourself. You're going to figure out what your purpose in life is, yeah. and then you're just gonna drive to that. Mm -hmm. And you, you hope and pray that your partner does the exact same. That's true. Right? You hope that they find their purpose as well. And if not, they can assist you. You guys can assist each other in your purpose. So that way, you know, you guys can yeah, exactly. grow together. Yeah, I love that. Right? Yeah. But what I have found as year seven, year seven and eight came, um, you know, I'm trying to pivot my life. Yeah. And I noticed that there's still like, it went from me jogging, I'm looking right next to me and he's there to like, you looking me looking back, back yeah. and I have to now I have to go from a run to a jog and now I'm walking. So now you're slowing down. I'm slowing so down. That way, man. And now I have to stop and look back and wait a little bit. Yeah. And that kind of like does something to the relationship. You know, although this person's amazing, smart, funny, yeah. you know, I wish him all the best. I hope he's doing well. Mm -hmm. um, at that time in my life, it, it just wasn't working anymore. And my advice to women is the person you are now in this relationship that you love so much is not 
who you will be later. Yeah, that's real. I have Phoenix at least three to four times in that relationship. So the person Cass was at year one through three was not the same person years four through six, yeah. not the same person seven to eight. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't tell women to invest in a relationship or marriage until they know who they are. Okay. First. Yeah. Because if I were to marry this person year five, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be at my highest potential at all Mm -hmm. because they wouldn't be growing with me. I think there's so much to be said there. One of the things that I think about is I think it's really important and I, I can speak I can speak to the men on this. It is really important that men, especially today, and I, I had to learn this. Mm-hmm. I had to learn this when I th- went through my season that eventually led to me being like, y'all need to get in the tech industry. Mm-hmm. It's really important for us to truly understand and realize that our women, at the very minimum, they want to see that we are, like you mentioned, using your analogy, that we are like running alongside. Mm-hmm that we're not lagging. But I believe at women's greatest desire is to have a man that they can look up to and be like, yes. wow. Yeah. And and be like, wow, okay. Now, that doesn't mean that there can be times where in a relationship where man, sometimes we might fall behind a little bit. And one, we have to be comfortable, we have to be secure in our masculinity to be comfortable with sometimes, hey, sometimes our woman is gonna pass us mm-hmm. and that's fine. But I think one thing, and I believe God has placed this on men's shoulders, is that one thing that we cannot do as men is just say, ah, I'm not running anymore. I'm just going to walk. And I believe naturally that is, whether you want to call it a turnoff or something that's a letdown to women. Yeah, it's disappointing. And so it's, I think it's really valuable for men to hear what she's saying, learn from that. Because I know obviously you're speaking to women, mm-hmm. but I believe like men, it's important for us to learn. Exactly to learn that. Like mm-hmm. when I... You know, at some point before I got in the tech industry and basically when when I I went like kind of MC Hammer broke and I was trying to date women and stuff and I started realizing I was like, oh, when you reach a certain age, women don't care if you're cute anymore. Yeah. Like they care, but it don't matter. They don't care if you're funny, you're charming. They don't care if you got followers on social media. They're going to be like, look, all of that's cool. But can you lead me? Right. Can you provide? Not even like on some gold digger stuff, but like, can like, look, look. I don't did all the cute dudes that was funny and dressed nice. Right. It's like I need a man that I can look up, look at, and be like, man, okay, you're running, your pace is next to me, or you're leading. Right. And once I realized that, that was one of the things that led me to say, you know what, I need to change something, and it ended up leading to me getting in the tech industry. Mm-hmm. So I think it's actually refreshing to hear that, and men should hear that, and be encouraged to be inspired by that. Because I don't think any man wants to be the kind of man that's like walking or letting his woman like just be far ahead of him. And many times men should just be advised to say, yo, like be the type of man that your woman can like admire and she can look at. Mm -hmm. And I think many times women are not comfortable enough with telling their man that. And it makes the men think like, okay, well, I guess I could just lag behind. But seems that that was something that you you learned and you realized and you were able to make that cut but what was that season of of i guess singleness like for you and what did you go through that prepared you for your husband and now family that season for me was a season of isolation and in that isolation i was able to identify where i was weak Mm -hmm. and whether it was my soft skills my personality like my confidence yeah and it it gave me the opportunity to invest in myself so for instance i had a crippling fear of speaking and it started yes i had a crippling fear of speaking it started when i was 18 years old Mm -hmm. um i had the opportunity to to compete in the miss (laughs) miss teen georgia uh usa pageant Mm -hmm. representing my county (laughs) my county and i remember it like it was yesterday i was on stage the MC had the, the mic in his hand, and he says, contestant number eight, and I walk up, the lights are blinding, the people are cheering, my family's cheering, and he says, what is your definition of a winner? And I blacked out, and I couldn't remember a thing, and it was humiliating, to say the least. So it wasn't until 
I no longer was in a relationship and I went to these family gatherings like Thanksgiving and, and I wasn't really myself anymore. I wasn't speaking up. Uh, I, I found myself cowering when the family's around the table and they're trying to say grace. I would literally run and go hide so that way no mm. one calls me to pray yeah. in public. So I decided to take it upon myself to join Toastmasters. I don't know if you're ever from, if you're yes, familiar with Toastmasters. Yes, it helps you with speaking yes. and things like that. Yeah. I joined Toastmasters Alpha 289 in Decatur, Georgia. Did that Was that actually beneficial for you? The best thing ever. Wow. It was the reason why I won the pageant. Whoa. It was, a, it was my sense, it was like a redemption. I was able to redeem myself. My very first speech at Toastmasters, I was shaking, literally shaking with a paper in my hand. Man. on stage and I, all I needed it was like the first 30 seconds I couldn't even speak I was just shaking and the my um, my fellow Toastmasters they were so encouraging they were like that's all right you're good even though time was going the, there's a timer for each speech and after each speech I got better and better and yeah. better and better and in that moment and in that season of I was unemployed <laughs> and single uh -huh. and I got the opportunity to um to volunteer at Dress for Success Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And there I was able to dress women who were either unemployed, underemployed, uh, fresh out of jail, abusive relationships, and I was able to prepare them for interviews. Mm -hmm. I would stand behind them in the mirror and I'd just tell them how amazing they are, how amazing they're gonna do in the interviews. And at that opportunity, I was serving. Yeah. I was behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I was still cast, fabulous, but I was serving. I, I was in that season. Mm -hmm. And there was a speaker that came to an event and she was a pageant queen and she just won a pageant. And uh, at the end of the event, she approached me and she's like, hey, have you ever considered pageantry? And I looked at her like, don't, don't even do this right now. Like, I'm not, I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. and, she, and she just asked me questions about my journey. What am I doing? And she's like, you're prepared, you're ready. You're ready. You're in mm -hmm. Toastmasters. You've already been a model. This is your time to compete. You have a platform because I've been volunteering for Dress for Success. So that was my platform. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. I won that pageant. <laughs> that's, man, that's so crazy. I didn't even know all of that about you. So, mm -hmm. so you talk about Toastmasters and how it, it really set you up for success when it came to being a better speaker and mm -hmm. communicator, especially yeah. publicly. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's lacking, and I mean, you mentioned this earlier about how many people, even though your first job in admission, your first sales job wasn't tech, but one of the things that the, the, the president has said is, hey, you can't teach some of these different things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I wonder, or not even I wonder, I know for a fact, is that many people that are in tech that aren't able to communicate or able to talk very well or be a, a good public speaker, many times they're not making as much money because of that. Yeah. Would you suggest someone that's in tech or wants to get in tech, whether they want to get in tech sales or they just want to like level up in their career, if they're like, man, I'm not that good at speaking, would you suggest they do something like Toastmasters? Absolutely. Okay. I, Toastmasters is single-handedly the reason why I am where I am in life right now. It's the reason why I won the pageant. It's the reason why I excelled in those interviews. It's the reason why I felt as if I was confident enough yeah. to get google yeah and, and the, the reason why i want to let y'all know the reason why i'm asking this first off toastmasters is not sponsoring this episode <laughs> i didn't even know that she did toastmasters but the, the reason for this is because i'm not sure if y'all have noticed a common thread with the majority of people that we've interviewed that are making the most money especially people that are making a half a million dollars plus one common thread with all of them is that either one they work in sales or two they have leveraged their communication skills to be able to grow their income in tech one of the reasons why I was able to make as much money as I did as quickly as I did was because of my my communication skills, my networking skills, all those pieces. And networking is really just an extension of your communication skills. Right. And so I wanted to, to to dial in on that, what you said, because I think there's value in here that, that I've never talked about. There's value in what she was mentioning with Toastmasters. So anybody where you feel that you're not that good at communicating or networking, definitely check out something like Toastmasters or something uh, similar to it. Uh, because again, I believe it'll provide value to help people scale uh, in your careers. If you're interested in breaking into a six-figure career in tech or scaling to over half a million dollars in tech, then this video is for you. If not, then just swipe away. But I was able to break into the tech industry October 2021. And in my first year, I scaled to over half a million dollars in tech. My second year, I was able to gross over a million dollars. More importantly, I was able to freely help over 600 people break into six-figure tech careers as well and scale further in the industry. 
Now, the number one question I've been getting from people is how was I able to do this? How was I able to make so much money? How was I able to also help as many people as I've been able to help? Well, aside from doing coaching calls and trying to spend a whole bunch of time helping people individually, I've decided to create the Tech Rich Program, where I literally break every single thing down that I've done and what I've been doing to show others how they can break into tech faster or scale to over half a million dollars plus within their first few years in the tech industry as well. All you gotta do, click the link in my bio, all the information's there, check out the description, message me if you have any other questions, and I'll see you on your journey scaling in tech. What has your experience been like at Google? Like, I, I know that, so you're at Google, what is your job exactly, and what do you do? So I've been at Google for over a year and four months now. Mm -hmm. June second, June 6th was my Googleversary, so okay. to speak. Um, and I work in sales Google under Google Cloud okay. under in the industry of healthcare life sciences, yeah. and I work as I serve as an account manager there. Okay, now as an account manager, because I'm I talk a lot about account executives. Mm -hmm. As far as you know, like. How is an account manager different from an account executive? Or really just what do you do as an account manager? I would say that account management is similar to a BDR role. Okay. It's more yeah. leaning towards the BDR. Um, so at at many tech companies, the industry, the, the sales umbrellas are broken down as a small business and it's commercial and it's enterprise. I yeah. am where some businesses call select, some business called uh, strategic accounts. I'm in the mm -hmm. big, I, that's where I sit. Okay. Uh, the strategic select accounts. So I'm familiar with uh, VSB, which is very small business, which mm -hmm. Google probably does not deal in very small business at all because it's very small business. Mm -hmm. SMB, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. small to medium sized business. Mid market, which I think might be the select or what you talked about, and then enterprise accounts, which is like the top, top or largest companies, basically. I'll be where the enterprise is where you're oh, talking oh, about. Oh, oh yeah. excuse me. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. It's, excuse me. Let me put some extra respect on your name. So, so you're <laughs> dealing with enterprise accounts. So account manager is similar to, like you mentioned, like a SDR type of role. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're a mother, your wife and a mother, two beautiful children. How has your, how has being a wife and a mother impacted your career in tech? Because you became a wife before getting in tech. And so how has like, how did that dynamic of you being married, having children, does it affect your career at all? Like whether like better or worse, like how does it impact it? I was actually in tech before I was a wife. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So after I left the Art Institute, I joined a company called New Relic. Okay. And this was an, it's an observability platform. And then I transitioned to Snowflake. Okay. And yeah. I, from when I went to Snowflake, that's when I transitioned into Google. So I've been in two tech companies before uh, Google, but I feel like after becoming a wife and a mother, the level of drive that I have now mm. with each call, which each opportunity, which each meeting yeah i'm hungry i'm like foaming at the mouth like at the, at the in a cage like i need to get it no matter what by wow. any means necessary because i have my family uh looking t at mom yeah. to hold it down and, and 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 support in the best way that i can so and i'm so glad i'm so glad and i'm blessed to be in a company that mm -hmm. not only um, allows me and provides me the resources to be the best I can for them. Mm -hmm. But in the season where I'm down and I gave birth four months ago and I'm on maternity leave, yeah. they've blessed me so much. Mm -hmm. So benefits is, I've wa I watched this podcast and yeah. benefits is a topic that doesn't really, do not really talk yeah, about Yeah, we don't talk about that. So let's talk about let's it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, so, so what, what are some of the benefits? The benefits at Google, are amazing as far as maternity and paternity leave mm -hmm. are involved. I have been on maternity leave for six months. It's my wait, maternity. Have, no, wait, my maternity have leave. Been. Are you still on it now? Yes, my maternity leave is six months. I go back to work. I gave birth in May. I go back to work in November. God no. One hundred percent pay. And you're being one hundred percent pay. One hundred percent pay. Let's okay. let's resonate that for a second. Wait, no, no, no. You gotta say that again. <laughs> run that back. Run that run back. That back. <laughs> yes, I gave birth in May. Uh, they gave me a few weeks prior to my delivery date just to 
Dang. Catch up to myself and relax. I lo- when I say I love That's crazy. Company. And then, you know, they give you a few weeks of baby bonding time. They give you a few weeks of maternity leave. And then when I go back in November, I get a ramp. I get two weeks of ramping just to go back into the role. Wow, just to kind of give you mm-hmm. some time to, that's... And an additional three months of working from home, and then I can go back to work. Oh, that's so fire. It's an, it's amazing. That's co- It's basically going to be almost a year yes. before you... Oh, that's why, without missing the check or anything at all. Mm-hmm. Nothing. That is fire. It's a blessing to be in a company that goes hard for you just as much as you go hard for them. Yo, shouts out to Google. <laughs> that, that, that made me want to Google something right now. That made me just want to just show some love to Google. Right. But it's Man. not just Google. Other tech companies are oh, yeah. very similar. Um, so that's the other side of uh, yeah. the tech industry that people don't really talk about is the benefits. Yeah, no, we, yeah. we don't talk about that enough. And I think when we talk about benefits, usually we talk about things like, you know, okay, some tech companies you can work from home. We talk about, oh, they, they cover, they will cover your Wi-Fi, they'll give you a laptop, mm-hmm. you know. But it's like those are benefits where, yeah, we don't talk about that. Yeah. And so, because it's, it's one thing, like, people are happy when they're at a company where, okay, they allow maternity leave. But usually it's traditional where it's, okay, when you actually are, like, going into labor, okay, now your maternity leave starts. And maybe it lasts for two to three months. But that's entirely different in tech, especially at tech companies like Google. And it doesn't stop there. If you're, say, for example, you are, uh, a, you and your partner are having issues conceiving. Mm-hmm. They have benefits for adoption. They have benefits for IVF. Oh. They have benefits for all of that. Mental health. It it doesn't stop. It's unbelievable yeah. how blessed <laughs> I am to be in this yeah. industry and we are to be in this industry. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that that I tried to harp on. I, I think I've gotten away from that where it's more, and I tell people, I'm like, yo, it's more than just the money in this industry. It's like, it's a different culture. Yeah. It's it's night and day from working in other industries. Mm-hmm. It's like it's it's like being in a different world that t- to most people that aren't in tech, it sounds like it sounds like a utopia. It's like, no, that sounds like cap. That sounds way too good to be true. And it's like, no, this is literally how this. I have a running joke that I say all the time. Shouts out to shouts out to uh, all, all my my non black people, all my white skin folk. Love y'all. <laughs> but there's a joke that I, a running joke that I have where I'm like, yo, once I got in tech, I was like. This is why white people be so happy all the time, because <laughs> they work in companies like this, enjoy mm-hmm. all these benefits and perks and the mm-hmm. beauty of these things. And even though it's a joke, realistically, it's like, man, it does make life different yeah. when you're at companies where they go above and beyond to really do things to show that they care about you yes, and they want you to thrive. And that's beautiful. I'm, I'm so happy that you're able to have something just so beautiful. And I was so excited because I didn't even know you were in tech. When I found out you was in tech, I was like, what? <laughs> I went, that's why I was, you're, you're, you are the only person that I kept blowing up to come onto the podcast. Because I was like, no, man, come on, you got to come the on. The timing had to be right. When you reached out to me the first time, I was literally like a few weeks postpartum. Oh, yeah, I know. I felt I felt bad when I realized. I was like, damn, I'm literally like, man, bump your paternity leave. Come on, come on, take us in. It's like, okay. She's like, hold up. No, if Google let me on paternity leave sorry y'all gonna have to chill out and just wait a little <laughs> bit of a minute so uh so no that's uh that's hilarious I, I i love that for you though that's that's so incredible so all right so we talked about at the beginning of this uh interview about just how and i'm sure y'all can see it now just how, how feminine she is how soft she is beautiful bold personality that's still like that's still in itself still very feminine and soft and again many women feel as if tech is not for them and especially women that feel like, okay, well, I feel like I'm like just very feminine, very soft. Not only do many of them not feel like tech is for them, many of them think there's no way tech sales is for me. Mm-hmm. How have you been able to, I don't even want to say balance, but like marry being just who Cassandra is, being that, as I say, the epitome of femininity and womanhood. Appreciate that. And now motherhood mm-hmm. and wife, wifehood, if that's even a word, but wifehood, all of those things but also able to not just survive, but thrive in tech sales. Right. How have you been able to do that? And what would you communicate to women that would want to know, okay, how can they do that? You know, there's power in being feminine. Yes. Especially in the presence, in in a leadership position. You Mm -hmm. know, you don't have to wear, I don't have to wear like a three-piece suit and like, 
you know, trousers or I can I can wear my dainty jewelry and my dresses and yeah. my heels and get the job done. Uh, mm-hmm. The beauty of being in the tech industry is it's it's not intimidating to where it's like a male dominated field anymore because when I go into talking to my prospective clients, my prospective customers, and I'm talking to members in the C suites of different companies, yeah. some of these members are women. Yeah. So it's That's very really comfortable. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very comfortable. I'm not, and in, 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 even if the entire leadership team, the CTOs are men, mm-hmm. you know, as, as long as you are a subject matter expert. Yes. You understand the pain point. You know the right questions to ask. The, the matter approach, you're going to get the job done yeah. no matter what. So whether if your approach is more soft, um, subdued, a little nervous, a little mm-hmm. quiet, you know, it's still a conversation. I used to be so intimidated by the fact that, you know, oh my God, I'm about to speak to the CTO. Oh, what do I do? Yeah, this person is, like, yeah. <laughs> but when you get, when you hop on the call and you get past the warm and fuzzies of like, oh, how's the weather over there in California? <laughs> <laughs> and then you get down to like what we do here at Google, what can we provide for you? Yeah. What are your pain points? What's the side of the house do you sit on? What industry or what, you know what I mean? You ask those questions, yeah. you realize they're just normal people. Exactly. And I love the fact that when I'm on these calls, Sometimes their kids are screaming in the background and they bring them in and they sit them on their laps yeah. and, and I get to meet their kids. And it's just two adults that are parents. I'm trying to solve your problem. Yeah, that's all it is. It's all problem solving. Yeah. Just be yourself. Be confident. Be the subject matter expert. You're there for a reason. I have to get past my um, imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. Like, oh my God, how did I get here? I earned this seat. Yeah. I was scouted. Did I bang on their doors years ago? Yes. <laughs> Did I get yeah. rejected more than five times to Google? Absolutely. But yeah. when the time came, I was ready. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. So last, last couple of things I want to ask. So one, I actually want to kind of double down on what you just said. So you applied at Google more than once before. You've been Absolutely. rejected. Because I knew it was my dream company. Yeah. I know I've always, that was always the end goal. That's good. So you were rejected by them. Mm-hmm. How many times were you rejected before eventually they spun the block? I was rejected at least th- three, four, five times yeah. before they spun the block. Um, hilarious. Yeah. You know, the first couple times it was within 24 hours. Like you apply and then you get that email like, thank you so yeah, much right for away. applying. Like, dang. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like, y'all even take a chance to look at me. Did you even look at my resume? <laughs> Um, but the last, I believe the last time that I applied for it, I knew that I had to do something different, right? Mm -hmm. I took it upon myself to go in, go on Google Cloud's uh, YouTube page, find out these interview questions that they, there's, when I say there's so much information on YouTube, there's Mm -hmm. no excuse. There's so much information. I found uh, videos on the type of resumes that they look at, the type of resume, what to put on the resume. And I was in the lab, okay? Mm -hmm. So by the time I applied, I got rejected, but that new polished resume was in their database. Oh. It was sitting there. Yeah. So when 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 that opportunity came and that seat was open and needed to be filled, the recruiters do what they need to do. They go back to that, they go back to their files to see what's there. Yeah. And that's how they found me that's because weird. that resume was just sitting there. So even though you're rejected, do the work. Yeah. Your your resume could be beautiful, mm-hmm. perfect. But if the time is not right, this time is not right. Yeah. But because I did the work, that resume that I took four to five hours just redoing was for Google alone. It wasn't for another company. Mm-hmm. I did that. I, I invested that time just for Google. Yeah. And for it to just be sitting there for months before they got back to me, it Man, was I, worth it. 